Hello everyone and welcome to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 18 verses 7 through 9. And now, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we praise your name. We thank you, God, for your death on the cross for our sins, that we do not have to endure the wrath of God in hell for eternity, because you have taken the price upon yourself. Lord, we praise your name, and we thank you for the mercy you've shown us each and every day. Lord, we pray and ask that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. We thank you, Lord. We submit ourselves humbly to you and your word. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew 18, 7 through 9. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to the man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or your foot causes your downfall, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes your downfall, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than to have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. Now I would like to argue that the meaning of these verses is as follows. In these verses, Jesus lays out the truth that the world is against him and his gospel, and that this is all part of God's sovereignty. However, he warns individuals who attempt to cause God's children to stumble that they are in danger of severe judgment and hellfire. And so now let's move to the exegetical portion of the sermon. In verse 7, we read, a woe is being given against the world. And the word woe is a common expression denoting a serious warning of impending doom. And being to the world, or the cosmos, implies a world order, or a world culture, or a world system. And it refers to the whole realm of what humans do and what they're involved in. And so this is being used at this juncture to make a distinction between those of the world and the world system and those of the kingdom and the kingdom system. In other words, those of the world are those who have alienated themselves through their sin from the life of God and who have not received redemption. The world, apart from God, will be judged because it places stumbling blocks before God's children. And so the warning then becomes more personalized. Woe to the man through whom the stumbling block comes. And so this is both a condemnation to the system and to the unsaved individual who stands in the way of the salvation of others. And so in verses 8 and 9, we see that this section is devoted to a hyperbole, which is to show the seriousness of causing someone to stumble. But here Jesus has changed the emphasis onto one's own self stumbling and being a stumbling block to oneself. The conditions of being lame, crippled and blind would absolutely be bad. But these are preferred over being cast into a fiery hell. And the same thought is found in Matthew 5, 29 through 30. The emphasis is on the personal application of the warning. Now, the enticement to sin can come from outsiders. It can also come from one's own body. This doesn't imply the body is evil, just that it's vulnerable and fallen. And so we understand this passage is a hyperbole. It's a figure of speech that overstates a situation in order to accentuate a critical lesson. Jesus here is not uh, commanding self-mutilation or amputation, but illustrating the horror of being cast into an eternal fiery hell. Additionally, he's not describing how one is saved here, nor is he describing how one is sanctified. Rather, the focus here is on the severity of eternal judgment. And so what is this hell? It's a place of torment eternal fire. It's a fiery hell or hellfire. Barnes states, quote, it's a compulsive proof that the sufferings of the wicked will be eternal when scripture talks about eternal hellfire. This passage is not about the potential of the disciples losing their salvation. Rather, quote, it's about the horror of eternal punishment and the motivation not to stumble and not to cause others to stumble. Mark 9, 42 through 48, we see that fiery hell is a place of unquenchable fire. Jesus quoted from Isaiah 66, 24 as well. For their worm shall not die, and the fire shall not be quenched. And it's very important to see that loss of salvation is inconsistent with this immediate context. This is talking about the penalty of hell, 
and those who will endure it, those who are not saved, who are stumbling blocks to themselves and others. Now, the primary point then of these verses is the comparison between amputation and suffering in hell. That's the primary point. And salvation from this terror of hell is found in other verses, John 3.16 and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, where the focus is on salvation. Okay, the focus is on forgiveness. But the focus here is on the terror itself. Now, in terms of exposition, I want to dive a little bit into this woe concept. So woe is, is a prophetic death. In other words, Jesus is pronouncing a woe. He's pronouncing a future doom or judgment. And given the near references to hellfire, it's important to take these verses in the sense of eschatology. So this is the prophetic death under the wrath of God that is being pronounced. But who's really in view here? Well, in the previous verses, we saw that the people in view are those who cause one of the children of God to stumble. In this first verse here, we see these are people of the world, the cosmos, who operate within the world's thinking. Thus, the judgment is for the world and those who abide in the world's principles. And we see that the individual who participates in causing a child to God to stumble also has this pronouncement of woe. Now, I want to take a moment and ask, what are the common issues and misconceptions? Well, people may worry that this may be referring to themselves, but we really don't have to worry about that. Why? Well, we're not in view in these verses. Christians are the children of God. We're not of the world. Second, this isn't referring to issues of Christian doctrine or things generally considered orthodox. So just differing theologies isn't causing people to stumble in the gospel like these verses are talking about. These verses consider the doctrines of the cosmos or world evil doctrines, unorthodox heresies, false religions. That's what they are. That's what's at stake here. Additionally, the offense is related from the previous verses to the gospel. So these verses are talking about people who outright and vociferously fight the gospel going forth and lead people into rejecting the gospel or stumbling. So now what about the response? Well, the interesting thing is that general sins aren't really even what's in view here. What is in view here are the beliefs that put one in a position to be under God's wrath. But Jesus likes giving things that are spiritual a physical reference so that people can understand what's really at stake and to take this seriously. So thus, he makes these comments about amputation. But again, what are these referring to? They are the physical ways of referring to the beliefs that people will hold that make them into stumbling blocks. The case in point, a foot's not going to cause your downfall, nor is a hand, nor is an eye. Why? Well, one's beliefs, one's heart, and one's mind bring about the downfall. You may do bad things with your eyes or your feet or your hands, but what's actually causing your downfall? It's your heart, it's your beliefs, it's your mind, it's your decisions. The point Jesus is making is that if one of these physical things were to bring a downfall, the fall is so bad you'd be better off amputating the part of your body. So what is the real recommendation? Amputate the beliefs that one has that are preventing one from hearing and responding to the gospel and causing one to be a stumbling block to others. And what's the consequences of ignoring this warning? A woe. What is a woe? Judgment under the wrath of God. And what is that for a human? Eternal hellfire and judgment. And so we can see here that what's being prescribed is not something meant to instill fear that one could lose their salvation, nor is it meant to instill fear about whether one is saved or not. This is a woe being pronounced over those people and the world who argue against and actively fight against the gospel and that there is a severe penalty and judgment for doing so. Now, in terms of the Christocentric setting, we see here Christ as judge. He is absolutely a judge if he's delivering the woe, he's issuing the penalty. We see him definitively stating what is right and wrong and exacting punishment on wrongdoers and the world. In terms of application, uh, there are two main points. The first is that we have to understand that attacks against Christianity and the gospel are a part of the world in the stage. If we go back into the verses, we see these words. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. In other words, Satan is at work in this world, the devil and his demons are at work in this world, and offenses to the gospel are going to come. People are going to fight against the gospel. The world's systems are set up against the gospel. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we see these things in our, in our modern day, when we see news stories and things about these offenses to the gospel coming, refusing to allow people to homeschool, refusing people to allow to attend church during the COVID era, 
you know, we shouldn't be surprised that powerful people in this world would be against Christians. Jesus predicted that it would be the case. He said this is going to be the case. And so we need to understand that in spite of all of those things, God is sovereign. Again, Jesus is even admitting that. He's here saying, look, all of this is going to come, but this is all under God's sovereignty. He's totally okay with this in the sense of sovereignty. Obviously, he's pronouncing a woe to those who are doing it. There's judgment that will come, but he absolutely understands that this is all part of God's plan. Now, the second applicational point is incorporating eternal judgment into your gospel presentation. So we have a problem in modern Christian evangelism where we have this fear of fire and brimstone preachers. And what do I mean by that? I mean that people have heard maybe back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s fire and brimstone preachers, or maybe they've heard fire and brimstone preachers at, at their universities or on the streets. And so they have a knee-jerk and instinctual reaction against talking about hell in any way, shape, or form during a gospel presentation. And there's actually a pretty serious problem with that because hell does have to be part of our gospel presentation. People should understand what is actually at stake, the consequences. If all we say is that, oh, you now have a relationship with God and things will be great, that's not a real gospel presentation. That's not even probably true of what will happen if someone does indeed become a Christian. The better gospel presentation would be something like this. You are a sinner, as is every human being, as was myself. As sinners, without a payment, we have to pay the penalty ourselves. And that penalty is eternal judgment in hell. Now, the interesting piece of this is that God has sent his son Jesus to pay a penalty, the penalty for sin, to receive the fullness of the wrath of God on our behalf. And he paid that through his death and shed blood on the cross. And that when we believe in him, and when we're born again, given a new heart, and believe in Christ, then that sacrifice is applied to our lives and we receive the righteousness of Christ in our lives. And when that happens, we pass from the wrath of God to the grace of God. We pass from eternal death in hell to eternal life with Jesus in heaven and in the future kingdom. And he was resurrected three days after. And in that resurrection, he was vindicated, shown to be the true son of God, shown to be sinless. And that was the first fruits of the resurrection that will come. In other words, death will not hold us down even though we die as Christians. Death will not hold us down. But we will be resurrected as well in the end. And so when we talk about the gospel, incorporating the actual real penalty on our behalf that we would have to pay is vital and important. And so in conclusion, I would like to say this. We will face many offenses to the gospel in the church era. We must hold firm to the truth and instruct those around us in the scriptures and the gospel that they might not stumble but receive eternal life. And now, let's close in prayer. Lord, we pray for those who are still under the wrath of God. Lord, we ask that you bring them to the truth, bring them to the gospel, give them new hearts, eyes that see and ears that could hear. Lord, we pray for their salvation, and we pray that they would be added to the church. Lord, we rejoice at every salvation, for every salvation is a miracle, and every salvation is eternity impacted. So, Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for your sovereignty. We ask for the strength to persevere through difficult times and offenses. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. I hope you have a wonderful day.